uh, for all these soldiers. So they say, how can we create something that helps these soldiers employ themselves? So the SBA was founded where it provides loans, government guaranteed loans, where a soldier would return home from war. I'm going to open up my own pizza shop. I'm going to open up my own dry cleaner. I'm not waiting for a job from GE or GM or a different company. I can create my own business and then employ the people in my community. So that was the whole reason and the impetus for the SBA loan program. So fun fact as well, you're probably holding an iPhone, right? Without the SBA, I see an Apple laptop there. Without the SBA, you might not have Apple products. Under Armour, if you work out, you might not have Under Armour. Chipotle, love it, right? You might not have that. I couldn't imagine a world without Chipotle. So these publicly traded companies were all founded with either a loan or an investment from the Small Business Administration. So I'd like to share that fact. It's not just for pizza shop, dry cleaner, Main Street business. It's for an idea that can then turn into something that changes and shapes our lives. Now, I'm sure some investor would have provided some capital to some of these businesses and they would have been okay, but without the SBA, they would not have gotten their start that they did. So happy that that's there and that uh, our good friend Dwight Eisenhower decided to keep himself busy. SBA, so there's four prongs, access to capital, can take out a loan, help you get back on your feet, help your business recover. So they do about $2.3 billion of that in 2022. So they're a direct lender. Next is what I do as a bank. We lend to Lily. I lend a million dollars to Lily. I promise you that's the last time, Lily. I'm going to go to Brandon. <laughs> so I lend a million dollars to Lily. The SBA says, okay, instead of us lending, if you lend it, Chris, from your bank, we'll provide a government guarantee on that loan. If she doesn't repay you, we'll give you a portion back and we'll talk about that later. Next is the, and there's 35 billion that flows for that program. And later we'll talk about the demographics, like who's getting a piece of that pie, like women, minorities, veterans. We'll talk about the percentages there, but typically 35 billion runs for that program in a given year between the different loan programs. Next is the SBIC, which is the Small Business Investment Corporation. So this is the private equity piece to SBA funding. So private equity, I have KKR up there, but they don't participate in this program by any stretch of the matter. They have, they're good, right? So private equity funds, they pool their own capital. Then the SBA says, okay, we'll match your capital dollar for dollar up to $2 for every dollar that you've invested, right? So university, they pull that capital together and then they invest into small businesses. So this is how Apple got their start. It was through an SBIC fund. So $3.8 billion is funded through the SBIC program in a given year. There's only 300 active SBICs out there compared to the 2,500 active SBA lenders. So and that program is growing year over year, but um, SBA lending by far is the greatest use of proceeds or access to capital through SBA. Any questions as far before I continue on? Okay, good. SBA loan, so this is what we do. This is how we keep our lights on. So I lend, what was your name again? Neil. Neil. So I lend Neil a million dollars. He says, hey, and I understand you've started a few businesses, right? So your third one comes about and says, hey, Chris, I saw you at the presentation. I need a million dollars to start this tech company. I say, hey, Neil, it seems like you got a good plan here. Here's a million bucks. Under normal circumstances, right? If Neil somehow this third enterprise is not successful, he says, Chris, it didn't work out, loan defaults. I lose a million bucks. I'm like, Neil, why? Why'd that happen, man? We're not friends anymore. Neil, why'd you do that? Work harder, man. The SBA loan program, what it does, it mitigates risk for our bank. So I lend Neil a million bucks. I've got a 75% guarantee. The SBA says, hey, Chris, if you take a shot on Neil and you lend him a million bucks, if it doesn't work out, we'll give you $750,000 back. What's the better deal for the bank? Having that government guarantee, right? Especially a bank of our size, where we're much smaller than the Bank of America or a Truist, right? We don't have the capital base to sustain considerable losses. So having that guarantee from the SBA really helps. 
Uh, another reason why we do this, we sell the guaranteed portion of SBA loans on the secondary market. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, one would think, and I would think this as well, okay, if you got a government guarantee, essentially an insurance policy, then you can lend to anyone with a pulse, right? Well, you got a 75% guarantee. Why would you do prudent lending? You got someone that's gonna cover your loss or a portion of it. Anyone wanna take a stab at what's the default rate for an SBA loan? What's your name back there? Near, near the, all the food, good seat. <laughs> Bryce? Yeah. What, what do you think is the default rate for an SBA loan? 25%. Okay. Anybody else? 3%. 3 You're getting closer. It's 0.43%. So it's less than a half of a percent. That's actually down from the prior years, like 0.6%. So what I like about SBA, again, this is all public information. You can look these stats up. Day over day, right, and see how the SBA loan performance is, or excuse me, the SBA loan performance as a whole as well. So you cannot, as a lender, just make any loan under the sun because you can have your privilege to originate SBA loans revoked by the SBA and you can't participate in the program. Now, the second thing is we've got this 75% guarantee, right? Going back to Neil, million dollars. I say, hey, SBA, Neil couldn't pay me back. Here's our underwriting, here's what we did in our analysis. They're going to review that package, right? And they'll say, hey, Chris, Neil had a, not, this is not true. Neil had a foreclosure and, you know, this here, you missed that on the financials and his business plan didn't quite add up. I don't think you should have made this loan. Instead of 75%, we're going to pay you back 60%. That's called a repair. So it becomes a negotiation. So it's not as simple as, hey, SBA, Neil didn't pay us back. Give us our money. There's a negotiation that happens oftentimes where they pay us a little bit less than 75%. Yep. Yes, you do. And I'm going to talk about that later. Yeah. So you got the PG and then you're, then you're working it out with the federal government, which we don't want to get into the dark side of things, but we will <laughs> later. Uh, the second thing that could happen. Yes, ma'am. It depends on the bank. So our bank, thankfully, knock on wood, we have a charge off rate that's like less than 2%. So that's pretty good for an individual bank and a community bank of our size. Um, you get what's called a, and this is getting into the weeds a little bit, like a screen out. So initially, they're always going to say, we're not paying you back. It's the government, right? They're saying, absolutely not. You did all, you did these 20 things wrong. And then you have to say, no, I actually did that. I, I gave you this document. We did analyze this. And they say, okay, all right, we'll give you your 75% back. So they, it's, a, I won't say it's a scare tactic because we're on live stream, but <laughs> they send you a list. Rarely ever do they just cut the check for the 75%. So that's a great, what was your name? Bakar, that was a great question. You yes, might touch on this, but like the same, <clears throat> thinking on the bank side of things, is there a checklist for types of people you should grant SBA loans to, or like what a business proposal should look like? Because I'm thinking that, if a random person at the bank is deciding whether this is a good idea or not, mm -hmm. it, you're taking on a lot. Yeah, definitely. So, so the SBA, they do publish like, here's exactly what you need to have in your file if you're doing an SBA loan, down to your personal financial statement, tax returns, business plan, projections. As long as you have those and you do the proper analysis, you should be good. Now, each bank is different as far as who decides what loans gets approved. In my bank, we have loan committee. I don't have signing authority. so. My team, we pitch loans, we suggest loans, but I don't have authority to approve them because I run production. That's a conflict, right? If I, of course, I'm going to say, yeah, do that loan, do this loan, do this loan, because that's how I'm paid and our whole team is paid, right? So there's checks and balances as far as who signs off on that. But to answer your question, yes, they do provide a list of what you are to provide. Um, my train. The second part is the denial. So this can happen if you made a loan that is completely ineligible. So they'll send you a letter and say, hey, we're denying your guarantee no negotiation, no settling down from 75 to 60%, flat out zero. But at that point, you got a zero uh, commercial loan. And just the first loan that we mentioned to Neil, I'm taking the loss of the full million bucks. So we do these loans because we're taking on less risk and then we're selling it to an investor on the secondary market. So here's the segue into that. So banks make money three ways. Actually, there's multiple ways, but here's the three most common ways. One, interest income, right? We all know the typical analogy, have deposits at 4%. I lend you money at 8%. That spread is 4%. That's how banks keep their lights on, right? The next is fee income, ATM withdrawals, service fees, wire fees, overdrafts, things like that. 
Uh, the next is non-interest income. And for our bank and a lot of SBA banks, this is how they make the lion's share of their money. Not on interest income, it's on non-interest income. So we take that 75% guaranteed loan and we sell it to an investor for a premium. So we'll walk through this example and hopefully it sticks a little bit for you. You've got a $4 million SBA loan, 75% guarantee. 75% of 4 million is 3 million, right? I'm in agreement. The investor is going to say, hey, Chris, I'll buy that $3 million of guaranteed debt by the government, plus I'll pay you 10% of that, right? Follow me there? So they're going to cut us a check for $3,300,000. We're going to sell that debt to the investor. We're going to keep the $300,000 of premium that they paid, right? We're going to retain the unguaranteed portion. So in our first year on that loan, we're going to make $300,000 from selling the guaranteed portion. And then we're going to make roughly $100,000 of interest on the $1 million that we kept on our books. So we're going to make about $400,000 on that loan. And we sold it to an investor and that risk is off of our books. And now we have more capital to lend. Now the investor, they just bought a loan that's guaranteed by the government, right? In the event of default, we still have to pay them back their money. Then we work out the repair denial situation between the SBA, right? So the investor always gets their money back, right? So it's a safe risk bet. And now they have the interest on the life of that loan, right? Which is typically 10 to 25 years. So in the first year, they're making $306,000 on that loan. Subsequent years, similar interest, and obviously that will decrease as the print. We all know how that works, right? Does that make sense? Now, why would we give up $300,000 per year in interest for 10 years or 25 years for $300,000 now. Does that, anyone questioning that? Does that make sense as far as the business model? Repayments. Right. So the reason why we do it, <laughs> what'd you say? <laughs> oh, the, <laughs> he has the answers. So the reason why we do it, especially a bank of our size, we need liquidity. That's most important for us. So the more money we have, the more money we can lend. I'd rather get that $300,000, make a loan in 30 days, sell it and get $300,000 now than have to wait 12 months to get that $300,000 because I can take that $300,000 along with 10 other loans, pool it, and I can make 10 more loans, right? Does that make sense? So that's the reason why a lot of banks, they sell 90, 95% of their guaranteed portion of their loans on the secondary market so they can have increased liquidity and lend back to small business concerns. Any questions before we move on from that slide? Yes, ma'am. So that is not public. So the number of approvals yeah. and the dollar amounts is public information, but the number of loans that were declined or not approved, that's not public information because the SBA only knows when you approve a loan and you enter it into their system to get that authorization number. I would say, you know, for our bank, we had a difficult time. It really depends on your staff and your loan officers. Some loan officers are true just salespeople. They will send anything that has a pulse in and say, hey, you guys figure it out. And they just make bad loans and they go to another bank eventually. Some loan officers like myself, you know, you're credit trained, you have an underwriter's mindset, you know how to help people structure their deals properly and you have a higher approval rate. It should be, you know, nine out of 10. If you understand your bank's credit appetite, nine out of 10 deals should be getting approved. Anything less than that, then you don't quite understand what your bank is looking for in their credit appetite. That's a great question. So what are the benefits? So there's, I always look at, there's three players in this SBA space, and then there's the borrower, which we'll talk about that. It's interesting, SBA, you spend most of the time talking about everyone else besides the borrower, but we'll talk about that. So the bank, we're in this because it mitigates risk for us, right? Again, going back to Neil's example, I got a 75% guarantee if he doesn't pay me back. Second, the reason why we're here, non-interest income. Instead of waiting 12 months, I'm gonna get my money right now and I can take that money and make more loans. The SBA, why are they in this space? Job creation. In fact, the forms that a borrower completes, you have to list out the number of jobs created or retained because of this SBA loan. So that's data that they actually track. That's the sole purpose they're in this. Guarantee fees. Now, no one asked me and looked at me and said, okay, well, how is the SBA paying all these banks back 75% of the loans? Are they using my taxpayer dollars? I've had some borrowers like that were not happy with our decisions yell at me and say, you're taking my taxpayer dollars. That's not the case. So the SBA loan program is actually a zero subsidy program. That means it's not funded by your taxpayer dollars. 
There are guarantee fees included in each SBA loan, typically one to 3.25%. Actually, it's loans greater than half a million. I want to make sure I'm telling you the right information. Loans greater than half a million dollars have an SBA guarantee fee baked into the closing cost. So that money that we collect, we send it to the SBA. So let's say on a $900,000 SBA loan, that guarantee fee is 10 grand. I got to send that to the SBA. So the SBA has got this reserve account of guarantee fees collected over the history of SBA for 70 plus years, right? So when a loan defaults, they say, okay, we're good. We got it. We pull from our reserve account of guarantee fees, pay the bank, bank makes more loans. They get guarantee fees. It goes back into that account. So that's how that works. And then it preserves their capital too, right? So instead of the SBA making the loan, why not have the private sector bank make the loan, put their own money up? We'll just provide a guarantee. So if it doesn't default, we don't have to shell out any money. Lastly, the investor, which is the most important piece, because without the investor, I guarantee you don't have as many SBA lenders in this space because the investor provides that non-interest income for us to make more loans, right? So by them buying our guaranteed portion of our debt, it gives us more money to make more loans. And then for them, it's a safe bet. You've got a debt that's guaranteed by the government 75%. If it's not repaid, then the SBA or excuse me, the bank is going to purchase that back from you the full 75 percent and work that out with the SBA. The only real risk as an investor is prepayments, right? If someone refinances that debt or they default on the debt, of course, when defaults are different, we would pay it back. But if they prepay the loan early, so let's say you bought the loan and then month 10, they go and pay off the loan. They refinance it elsewhere. You as an investor, you didn't recoup all of the money that you gave to the bank because they paid off the loan too quickly, right? That's the biggest risk for an investor. The average life of an SBA loan is about seven years. The max term is 10 years for non-real estate and 25 years for real estate. Uh, secondary market premiums. This is just a, a slide here and I don't want to get too in the weeds. Premiums that an investor will pay are inverse to the interest rate environment. So as interest rates increase, the premium that an investor wants to pay actually decreases. Does that make sense? And the reason why, if I'm an investor and I know rates are high, I'm thinking everyone's going to refinance, people are going to default on their loans. I don't want this. I'm not going to invest in that. Now, when rates are low, I'm going to invest in that because most likely if you have a low interest rate, right, you're not going to refinance that loan. So I'm going to have more time to recoup the premium paid. So this is just an example here for typical loan priced at Wall Street Journal Prime plus 2.75%. 2021, that same loan, you would have got 11%. So don't pay attention to the 100 number, but 11.8% premium. Fast forward a year, as rates have increased, you're going to get 7.6% premium. So on a $4 million loan, that's a swing of about $100,000. That makes a heck of a lot of difference to a bank of our size, right? And any bank, really, if you pull that together with the number of loans that you do, we do 400 million in SBA loans in a given year. So on a $4 million loan, if you lose $100,000, you do the math on that and look at how much that income can swing. Now, premium markets are shifting back as rates will stabilize and there's less uh, increases here. So any questions on that as far as the all the other people besides the borrowers? So I want to talk about how the borrowers can benefit from an SBA loan. Good. OK. Use of loan proceeds. So most common real estate purchases, business acquisitions. You know, 25% of SBA loans are for change of ownership transactions. So that's me buying Brandon or Neil's business after he's grown his third enterprise and he wants to make his, make his exit. I'm going to take out an SBA loan to buy that business. We do a lot of franchise lending. So we all know what a franchise is. Now, the SBA, they do say it has to be on their franchise directory. So if there's an emerging franchise or let's think about Chipotle years ago before it was a well-known concept. The SBA has to approve that franchise to be an approved SBA franchise for borrowers to go out and open that franchise. You can buy out your partner. So Brandon and I, we own a business together. He says, man, I want to I'm going back to B school. I'm going to Vanderbilt. I want to do something else. Buy me out. I can go to my bank and buy him out with an SBA loan as well. And then just general working capital and machinery and equipment. That's actually a picture of a I lend a lot to uh, veterinarians historically. I've spoken at veterinary colleges all, all across the country. And that was like an old AT&T building and he converted it to a veterinary clinic. And it's like right downtown. It's like a, it's like cool. It's got murals all over it too. That was an, we closed that in like 30 days, which is pretty fast for SBA. Um, SBA loan benefits. So why do people take out, why you, the, let's talk about the picture first. So that's a true borrower of mine. And he said I could disclose his story. So this guy, 
This is probably one of my favorite loans that I've been involved in. So this gentleman, Lloyd, Lloyd have mercy, best soul food fried chicken in Florida. Uh, he was actually on Restaurant Impossible, the TV show. If you look him up, type in Lloyd have mercy uh, and uh, Andrew Lloyd, you'll find his episode. He actually did two episodes, one pre-pandemic, and then they had to go back post-pandemic because the pandemic happened when his episode aired, so they had to go back and film again. So he came to us. Uh, he says, hey, I want to buy my building, but I don't have 30% down, right? I can't do it. I've been here for 17 years in this space. He's also a pastor, too. Just a great guy. Been here for 17 years renting this space. Landlord said he's selling it. I have 90 days to get this done. Can you help me out? I'm like, sure. Let's look at your financials. Got the financials. There's adequate cash flow, right? Looks like a deal we can do. Called him back. I said, hey, Lloyd, what if we did this at 100% financing and you had to put no money down? And we gave you some working capital to refresh the property. He's a very emotional man. He started crying a little bit then, right? So I told him, yeah, I think we can do that. We got the loan in, got it approved, called him. He's like bawling on the phone. He didn't think he'd be able to get this loan. He cried again when we closed it, right? So the SBA product is good because it doesn't require a substantial down payment compared to a non-SBA loan, right? You can buy a building with no money down through the SBA loan program. Non-SBA loans, you typically have to put 20, 25% down, right? Why? Because they don't have that SBA guarantee. This is possibly the safest loan you can make, right? Not only do I have collateral, I got to lean on that building. I got the SBA providing a 75% guarantee. For some reason, should the value of that collateral shift or decrease, right? And I'm upside down. I still got the SBA that's going to uh, bail me out on that loan. So that's, he's a, I mean, he's a great advocate for the bank too. So that's just the true story of some of the benefits there. Uh, flexible collateral requirements as well. So if I'm buying, going back to Neil's business, I'm buying his business for a million bucks. He's got software, intellectual property, workforce, non-compete. None of that I can sell in a liquidation scenario to someone else, right? If that loan defaults, I've lost a million bucks, right? So I have to have that SBA guarantee because they're going to pay me back 75% of the loan. So that means I can take out a loan to buy Neil's business because I don't need a commercial real estate property backstopping it as collateral because I got the government guarantee behind it. Longer repayment terms as well, typically five to 10 years longer than a commercial loan, which decreases the monthly payment and improves the cash flow and debt service coverage. And then lastly, there's no balloon payments, which we hopefully all know what that is, where the amortization is longer than the term. Just some overview of SBA loan terms here. The maximum loan amount is $5 million. You can have more than one SBA loan. I've had borrowers that have come back four and five times. I have an attorney out in Vegas. He came to us for like 250, half a million, bought a building. I went to Vegas. He's got a billboard on the side of Mandalay that's probably as large as like half of Mandalay. It was a very cool story from like his origin. Like, so you can come back a number of times. For non-real estate loans, term is 10 years, real estate 25 years. What I didn't mention is the SBA, they dictate how we structure loans. If they're providing a guarantee, we gotta play by their rule book. So we have our own credit criteria as a bank, and then we have to play by their criteria as far as SBA eligibility and how you structure a debt. And then interest rates. So when I'm doing an unsecured debt, when I'm buying a business, primarily Goodwill, I don't have much collateral in the deal. Because of that and the risk associated with that, and also startup businesses, the interest rate is usually floating, meaning variable, adjustable on a calendar quarter basis based on prime plus a spread of 2.75%. Now, that can vary from lender to lender, but most often they are variable rate loans. Now, what would change is the spread over prime. Some lenders may say, I'll do 2% over prime. Some lenders may say 2.5% over prime. So that can vary from lender to lender. Now, when you're talking about real estate loans, that's when you have fixed rate options because you got collateral, right? And you have a government guarantee. So less risk in that deal. Not going to read all this. Don't worry. Don't, yeah, don't run out of the room uh, here. So just the things in orange got to operate for profit. So we can't help nonprofits, unfortunately. Must be considered small. So small is designated by the NAICS code. So NASIS code, North American Industry Classification uh, Standard or System, whatever we want to call it today. Um, they have revenue and employee size standards based on your industry. Under that threshold, you're considered small. Above that, you're too large for SBA financing. Personal guarantees, Neil, you asked about this, right? Personal guarantees are absolutely required. There's no way to avoid it. If you're a husband and wife and you own greater than 20% in aggregate, you both have to guarantee. 
It's got to be 51% owned by a U.S. citizen or someone who's a lawful permanent resident, meaning they have a, a green card. Then also there's a character component. So if you're uh, incarcerated or on probation or parole, you cannot obtain an SBA loan. Now they're working to change some of those rules to make it a little more lenient because you want to preclude a certain class of borrowers. And actually, I had this happen, not to me, I did, not on probation or parole, but I had this happen to a borrower. Uh, we approved the loan. We did some searches prior to closing, found out, hey, there's a charge here. We asked him about it. He said, oh, yeah, I got a DUI. This is my second DUI. I'm actually on probation. Well, sorry, we cannot close this loan. So we lost that opportunity to buy this business in that event, right? How, what a shame. A DUI is very serious, but what a shame to lose an opportunity to change your life and to help a small business grow. Uh, I got just two more slides left. So you, if you wanted to buy a business, right? Here are the typical terms. One, it's gotta be 100% change of ownership. So I can't take out a loan to buy into Brandon's business, but I can take out a loan to buy his entire business, right? So you can, it has to be 100% change of ownership. Brandon selling me his business, he has to exit within 12 months. He cannot be involved in any way. He can't be making any decisions and he can't have any equity into the business as well. So he's got to dilute his shares. Typically, it's an asset purchase, not a stock purchase, right? So I'm forming a new entity. I'm buying his business under my newly created entity and I'm going to continue operations under that manner. Uh, the primary consideration for an acquisition or change of ownership, debt service coverage, right? Is the business you're buying generating enough cash to repay the debt incurred? I don't care if you're Warren Buffett. I see it all the time where there's well-heeled, highly liquid borrowers. They come and they say, I want to buy this business. I can turn it around. I say, well, it sounds good, but not, not a fit for us, right? Because the SBA would say, you did not demonstrate repayment ability from the business to be acquired, not from Warren Buffett. So you have to prove that either on a historical basis or on a projected basis, that business you're buying can repay the debt. You give me the cue to get out of here. Yeah, wrap it up. He gave me the wrap it up cue. I didn't know if that was like there great job or you <laughs> this is the last one here. This is a true example of uh, he's my long time friend. He can do that. Um, this is an example. And I, unfortunately, we don't have our data based on like B schools, but I wanted to give an example. And we do a lot of people just like yourself. Right. Maybe you start you start working somewhere and say, hey, I want to buy a business as a supplemental income. Right. So this was a Harvard MBA that we financed down in Florida bought a commercial landscaping business with his spouse. That's the structure that we had provided from them and the EBITDA and the annual loan payment. So he had free cash flow, about 240,000 plus a salary there. And he's still performing well. And you'll notice the collateral exposure was $1.8 million. So we're mostly unsecured on that credit request there. So that's an opportunity for you if you wanted to pursue entrepreneurship and buying a business and typical structure there. All right. All right. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm take a load off um fair we kick i'll kick it off with a few questions awesome. and then we'll open up to the group yeah. um you know some takeaways i got from that is uh you know especially at business school or if you think about business in general and entrepreneurship um it's tough it's like very intimidating and you don't know how to get it going so uh can you talk about different avenues on how you can be an entrepreneur uh, while still continuing your job yeah i mean an sba loan right you want to look for a business that doesn't require a lot of your time or figure out how much free time you have, right? If you're working 60 hours a week, if you're at Goldman Sachs, right? Investment banker, you probably don't have time to buy a business, right? So figure out what your lifestyle is, what lifestyle you want to live, find a business that makes sense. A lot of business listings um, with business brokers, they'll list, you know, allegedly the amount of time required that the seller puts into the business. They say, okay, this seller, they work 10 hours a week in this business, right? Whether that's true or not, I don't know. You talk to the seller and really find and dig deeper in that, but find a business that works for your lifestyle. Are there certain uh, businesses that I can acquire? Say, hey, uh, Brandon, I want to buy a laundromat, uh, things of that nature. Are there certain uh, common things that you see that people acquire while they're still working their, their normal jobs? Um, a lot of, of service-based businesses. So they look, you look at the landscaping business, right? Because you're not necessarily a technician. So that person who bought that business, they're not cutting a, a, a blade of grass, right? They're not pushing their lawnmower at all. They're not cutting any hedges. They're running the financial aspect and helping to grow that business. So those are the type of business where you have a lot of technicians and workforce already in the business and doesn't require you to actually work in the business, but work on the business. So I think HVAC plumbers, uh, landscaping, pest control, those types of businesses. And also 
they're on recurring contracts, right? You sign up with a landscaping company. I'm sure some of you own homes in here, right? You sign up with your landscape, unless they like royally mess something up, you're going to continue to use that same landscape and they got your card on auto debit, right? So you're buying a book of business that's already um, fluid and running. Awesome, awesome. Uh, we talk about the access to capital. We mentioned that earlier. Um, I know that it's, it's pretty similar out in private equity and the venture capital world as far as entrepreneurs and small businesses trying to get kicked off. Uh, can you touch on what the landscape looks like as far as demographics, percentages within uh, you know, minorities such as women, uh, people of color, um, veterans as well? Yeah, yeah. So I can, again, beauty of this program, it's all public information for you to access yourself as well. So we'll talk about women-owned businesses right now. So women-owned businesses, businesses that are owned 50% or more by women, 14% um, of that pie of 35 billion goes to them. Um, the majority of loans go to males, like 72% go to male-owned businesses yet. So um, that has been kind of consistent over the course. They track this data back for, you can go all the way back to 2012 if you wanted to and see that. And you just, one of the things I do, I just follow the trends and the percentages. Um, talk about minorities, it's 32% uh, uh, are minorities that take out SBA loans, specifically African-Americans, three to 4%. And that really hasn't changed. It's one of the things that, you know, kind of rubs me the wrong way. It's like, why isn't this increasing? I know business ownership is increasing, but the percentage of that pie is not increasing. Um, Asian-Americans, 22% of the pie, right? So they have 22% of the dollars, but only 12% of the units. So that tells me they're taking out larger loans, right? Maybe a hotel, gas station, things like that. They're taking out larger credits. Uh, Veteran-owned businesses, typically 4%. That's been pretty standard across the board as well. So the beauty of SBA, you as a borrower have to fill out. You don't have to, but there's a form on there on demographic information. So they take that data, we input it into the system, and that's how they track who's obtaining these loans as well. So, uh, you know, there are some strides being made to kind of level the playing field to make sure that some of those percentages or pieces of the pie get larger for minorities and women owned businesses. And I am seeing a shift as far as who's asking me for the loan, who's coming to our desk, who knows about the loans as well. So I'm encouraged by that. But it's going to take a collective effort of just banks in general actively seeking out opportunities such as this where you're not looking for a sale. Like I'm not expecting to come out of here with a business card and, and hoping I'm going to get a three million dollar loan out of this. I just want to share the information that Lily hopes that I'd never call on her again. Five years from now, she would say, you called on me too much in that presentation, but I want an SBA loan from you. Right, right. Awesome, awesome. And then, uh, you know, going forward, what? how did you get into SBA lending? Like, we've known each other for years, but I didn't know what the heck you did and, and no one until, does. until think, a couple of years ago. So I, how'd you get into it? Yeah. And what do you enjoy about um, SBA lending? Yeah, so I think my mom... Both our moms might be watching, so I think she'll she'll know my now. Moms. Finally, yeah. Hey, mom. Um, how did I? The, the true story is, you know, I basically got fired from the teller line. Um, I was a teller. And I had the unfortunate skill. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll, we're in Vanderbilt, and I'm going to keep it very honest. I had the unfortunate <laughs> skill where I just my drawer was coming up short, but they liked me. I was a hard worker. And they're like, "Hey, go be a personal banker. At, go sit at that desk, right?" And so it was a nicer tone than that. And uh, I had the opportunity to open up and service all the SBA customers' accounts. So that's one of those relationship plays. I said, hey, I'll do that. I said, hey, we need someone to open up all these SBA loans. It's like a pain to do them. Can you do it? Yeah, I'll do it. And then I just built a relationship with the SBA department. This is back in Atlanta. And they said, well, hey, we know Chris. He always opens our SBA accounts. Give him a shot. And then my first loan, uh, I went upstairs. I, I played football in high school and college. And it was for an NFL player who played in college that I knew and followed. And he was opening up a, a Zaxby's chicken franchise, which also I love. And my first day on the job, they're like, read this NFL contract, figure out what happens if he gets hurt. Read this Zaxby's franchise disclosure document, figure out how they're performing. I'm like, and you're going to pay me to do this? Like, this is something I'm nosy, right? I would do this for free to read NFL. <laughs> Are you going to pay me to sit here for eight hours and do it? So that was my, I got hooked from then. Uh, what I love about it most is the people and the relationships. Uh, it won't take you all over the world because it's only for U.S.-based businesses, but it will take you all across the country. I've spoken to people, especially during PPP, that I should, you know, why I'm on the phone with this person, right? How did I get to this person? Um, all walks of life, all different backgrounds. And then I just love helping people, right? You're usually a part of a major event for their life, for their business. Either they're buying a business, they're retiring, they have retired, this is their second act. They're starting a business, going out on their own. 
this is a major milestone when someone's taking out an SBA loan typically, and you're a part of that, right? And then during that 30 to 60 day period, you're talking to them almost on a daily basis, right? How's the kids? How's the loan? You know, and then it goes to a period where loans close and they don't call you for two or three months unless something happens. So I get a little sad about that. But that's what I enjoy most, helping people, helping people grow their businesses. Uh, that's one more and open it to the audience. How, if I was looking for a job, I know a lot of people are here at Owen. Uh, how would I enter uh, the, the small business loan space within the bank? Ooh, that's, um, I mean, anyone in this room, it'd be very easy. Just call me. That's not it. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, usually I say it's best to start in like underwriting or credit analyst role because when you're going to learn the SBA SOP. So I didn't mention that it's a 400 page document of the do's and do nots of SBA. Right. The longer you're in the space, like I know maybe 20 pages of it in my mind, the rest I got to look up. But no, seriously, you start in underwriting, do your spreads, which you guys all have financial acting and you understand that piece. Then you learn SBA eligibility and criteria. And from that, that's the foundation for so many other roles where you can become a loan officer, you can become, we have an operations lead, you can become a closer, you can become different avenues. And I'm not gonna talk about money, but SBA is highly lucrative, right? People don't understand that because you think you work for a bank. There are guys, like, there are SBA lenders that make a million, two million dollars. There are people on my team that make close to, it's very lucrative because we sell those government guarantee loans on the secondary market, right? So it's not like your typical commercial banking role, right? And please don't cut that out of the program because SBA doesn't like to hear that, right? But it's lucrative because we're selling them on the secondary market and we're making a lot of loans, we're creating jobs, we're helping grow the economy. But to answer your direct question, start out in underwriting or credit analyst and then work your way and figure out your path. Awesome. Uh, open up to the crowd for questions, anybody? You mentioned the like, Harvard MBA study and like something that we see especially at the Harvard level, but and it's starting to trickle kind of down the rankings, but search funds. Yeah. And like there's kind of an attitude that you can raise money and you can attach it to debt or you can go all debt. Have you worked with search funds? Yeah, we, we have. There's um there's a few of them down specifically in Florida that we work with on a frequent basis where you're gonna have because that twenty percent threshold requires the PG, you're gonna have like nine people with some share of that 20% pie, right? And we don't have to collect a document from them because they're not a guarantor. Then you got one person who's gonna be the technician and work in the business. That's typically what we see in search fund uh, requests. Now, a few of them we've sent to the SBA for review and their blessing. Now, I didn't mention this, we're a PLP lender, preferred lenders program. We can approve an SBA loan without their oversight. Some lenders are not. They have to send their file to the SBA for approval. Sometimes we can leverage that ourselves if we're not sure if this loan is eligible or if it makes sense. So sometimes with the search funder loans, we'll send those into the SBA to get their concurrence. Now, a few of them we have gotten pushback. They say, okay, you've got all these people here that have less than 20% ownership. Why don't we know anything about them? What's their PFS? Why are they guaranteeing the loan? So there's, I'm starting to see some pushback on that because the SBA, you know, it's designed for people that don't have access to credit available elsewhere. That's one of the criteria as well. But to answer your question, yes, we do work with a lot of search funders, um, different, ser mostly service-based businesses, what I'm seeing in there. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, even at a bank of our size, you'd be surprised the amount of data that we track. I was talking to uh, Mario who's not here, but just, you know, I'm excited for where the future is headed with like the AI and all the technology that's in this space. And because of an, it's an SBA loan, the borrower has to typically disclose more data than they would with a non SBA loan. Right. So we can track like down the geographical regions. Are we having performance issues in Dayton, Ohio? What's going on there? Uh, we can track based on certain credit score thresholds, uh, NASIS codes. OK, not just a restaurant, but is it a restaurant that serves this type of food? Right. So we can get very granular on the data that we track. It's it. I wouldn't say it's scary, but I would imagine like a larger bank that the, the tools that they have at their at their helm that they can track the data. You know, some of these larger SBA lenders, they have better data than the, the government would probably have themselves, right? Because they have the technology and the workforce to track all of their loans and they don't go to any other website. They go to their own pool of loans. Yeah, I think we do a thousand loans each year, right? 
over the span of 10, 20 years, the number of loans that we have on our books that we can assess that data. So yes, we do. We look at those trends, you know, different like hotels, Hampton Inn versus Holiday Inn Express, like what's happening there? What are their occupancy rates? What's trending as far as that franchise brand? So we get very granular with that. That helps us with our decision making as well. It'll get to a point where, you know, we're going to be able to leverage a lot more of the technology and the AI and not be so dependent on like uh, human decisioning, which um, hopefully we find a balance there and don't like replace a bunch of jobs. But that's not your problem. <laughs> Me? That's a great question. Yeah, put me on the spot. So we, <laughs> so we, our bank, we established a minority-owned business lending program. Um, we actually incentivized our lenders to seek out minority-owned businesses, right? So that was attached to their incentive. And we marketed heavily. This was just in our Tampa Bay region where our bank is housed. We couldn't do it at a national level. Um, we did, gosh, upwards of $100 million in SBA financing throughout that three-year period that we had the minority-owned business lending program. So a lot of just education. It wasn't all about just let's make a lot of loans. It was about education as well. We pulled some staff and that was that were just liaisons. What I found, and I can say this because I'm minority um, as well, a lot of times the documentation that may scare or preclude a minority-owned business owner from moving forward, it's like, okay, show me your tax returns or your PFS. Maybe they're ashamed. Maybe they don't have it, right? But if you have a person that can coach them through that process and take the time to hold their hand through it, you're more likely to have them go through it. So we specifically, we had a program that we created um, specifically for that purpose. Some banks have similar programs, some do not, but a lot of banks are aware of that. And you got to remember too, the SBA oversees this program. We get audited on an annual, uh, biannual basis, right? So they come in, check our books. You want to do loans to minorities. You want to do smaller loans. That keeps you in the good graces of the SBA. This is a government-backed program, and all the politicians, right, they come take pictures with us in our bank because they know we do a lot of SBA loans. Like, Chris, oh, I know you, right? So we want to do those loans, whereas you're a commercial lender, you don't have that oversight from a government body, right, tracking how you're performing and who you're lending your money to. That's a great question. Yes, Ben. That's a that's a great question. So one to answer, they don't have to repay it early if they grow too quickly. But um, if you saw the slide, they must be a small business. Sometimes businesses grow out of that, right? Where they're not small anymore, and it's like, okay, this doesn't fit, right? Or you could also have exceeded your five million dollar cap on SBA lending. If you come to me, you buy two businesses. At two million dollars a piece and then the next one you want to buy another business and there's just not enough room there you got to go elsewhere or either pay down those loans that's one way too the business just become too large based on their size now there is an alternative size standard test where you have to have 15 million dollars in tangible net worth as a business which rarely do businesses have that most small businesses and five million dollars in net income on your tax return in the last two years the majority of the businesses that we have they don't grow out because of their growth they uh, exceed their maximum SBA dollars is, is when we can't, can't help them. They've reached that cap of $5 million. That's a good question, though. Neil, again, was, keeping us employed here. I like it. I was going to go buy a house, you know, I get pre-approved. And so, like, is there a way to get some speed in the process? Like, if it's a competitive deal when I'm trying to buy a business and there's two people that I... I'm going to have to take an SBA out and the other guy has cash. Like, is there a way to get pre-approved sort of, or you can't because you have to see their financials? Yeah, that's a great question. So one, we pre-approve the business, right? So me and my team, we work with a lot of business brokers, people that are selling businesses, your HVAC, your plumbing businesses. They'll come to me and say, hey, Chris, I got this listing. I got a plumbing business. I'm selling it at four times EBITDA. We all know what that is, or four, six times SDE, seller's discretionary earnings. What do you think you can lend on this business? Can you get me a pre-approval letter, right? And I'll look at the financials, we'll do the spreads and say, hey, I can lend 90% of this uh, purchase price, right? And they'll attach that letter to their listing. So then Neil, as you're searching for businesses, you see that listing like, oh man, I wanna buy this plumbing business. This looks great, it doesn't require a lot of my time. 
who, how can I get financing? Then you, at the very last page, you see Bay First Bank has pre-approved this business. Then you call me up. I say, oh, right, can you send me your personal tax returns, PFS? You check the box. That's one way you save speed. Pre-qualifying a buyer is tough because we don't know what business you're buying. Remember the example of Warren Buffett buying a business that lacks cash flow? It's going to be hard to get us uh, get that approved. So even if I say, okay, Neil, I know you have half a million dollars, so you can put a 10% down on a $5 million loan. You're pre-approved for that amount. I don't know what the heck you're buying, right? You can go out and buy a $5 million business that doesn't quite perform well, and you think you might be able to turn it around. So we don't do pre-qualification letters for buyers, but we do them for the business itself. That's a great question. Got another question. How do, do, I, how, how do I vet like who's the right SBA lender for me or, or the right bank for ah, me? Like uh, I'm sure they vary in some sort. Uh, risk profile. Mm -hmm. um, what are their strengths that you guys can provide? How mm -hmm. do I go through that process? Well, I mean, just you just call us first. I would well, hope you would yeah. reach out. Yeah. I'd be offended if uh, as you should. That. But no, going back to the statement I made a couple of times, the beauty of SBA, it's all public information. So first thing you want to look at, how much volume are they doing, right? Go to SBA.gov. Okay, you want to do, you're an SBA lender. If you do $10 million of SBA loans in a year, they're probably not proficient. Not saying that they're a bad bank, but they're not doing enough SBA volume to be proficient in the space. Also, there's a designation. This is the first thing I coach people on as well, or educate them on. PLP is that designation I mentioned, Preferred Lenders Program. 48% of that $35 billion is originated by a PLP lender. That means we can approve the SBA loan without oversight from the SBA. That's going to save you a month's time. And it also means you're working with someone who knows what they're doing. A non-PLP lender has to approve their loan internally at their bank, package that file and send it to the SBA for their concurrence and approval. Sometimes they don't approve it. Sometimes it takes two to three months. It's like sending your loan to the IRS, right? For an, Why would you do that, right? So you want to work with someone who is a PLP lender. That's the first thing you should ask your loan officer or your lender. Are you a PLP lender? If they say yes, proceed. If they say no, think about it. If they say they don't know, you know, run the other way because they should know, right? Um, you want to look at that. And then you want to ask them, okay, I'm buying an H, uh, a plumbing business, right? How many plumbing business loans, acquisition loans have you done in the past year, right? Do they understand the space that you're in, the industry that you want to acquire? I do a ton of veterinary loans, right? I was actually close to looking for a veterinary practice to buy. So I know like revenue per square foot for a veterinary practice, how much a doctor can make. I know that industry and my bank trusts me to know that industry. So if I bring a credit in, they're going to say, it's a veterinary loan. It's Chris bringing in, done deal, right? Whereas you might have another bank, they've only done one veterinary, they don't understand the industry at all. And they're gonna ask you a bunch of questions and they're gonna miss some questions to ask. And they're gonna to go to their credit team. There's gonna be more questions. So one, you wanna focus on, do they lend in that industry? How often are they doing loans in that industry as well? So first, look at their volume on SBA.gov. How much are they doing? Two, are they a PLP lender? Three, do they lend in that industry that you're either buying or starting your business and figure out if that's the right fit? Awesome. Any online questions? All right, we got time for one more question if anybody has one. All right, JB, close us out, man. JB, <laughs> good to see you again. Wild man, he's a wild man. We hung out in Chicago. I won't tell him about it. I won't tell him. I won't tell him. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the valuations, and so we, and also we have to order third party valuations. Uh, we cannot perform that ourselves. So that's another like safeguard for you as a buyer. The SBA requires us to go to a business appraiser. The multiples are still holding strong. In fact, they're increasing is the business brokers and the they don't really care about that. What's happening is because of the rising interest rate environment, it's getting harder for us to lend on that multiple, right? You think if the purchase price of the business increases, and our interest rate and that loan payment increases, right? It's squeezing the debt service coverage. So mm -hmm. for example, I got a daycare acquisition loan that I'm closing here in a few weeks, very tight on the debt service. Cause it was like a one, 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 six or something. Last year, if we had done it, you know, at the prime rate then, it would have been like one, eight, five would have been an absolute no brainer. So that's what's happening is the multiples are still increasing, but with the interest rate married that to the interest rate increase to make it a little bit harder to get deals done. Buyers are having to put a little bit more down. Sellers are having to hold a little bit more paper, do some seller financing until rates recorrect. All right. Well, I want to thank you for 
flying up from St. Pete. Um, I'm sure it's a little cooler up here than it is down there. It's not a, as much a sun, but thunderstorm. Um, no, I'm glad you had to make it um, and join the team. So uh, we're gonna give it up for Chris. Right. Thank you. I guess we'll get you some lunch. Yeah. 